I would like to take this opportunity to thank our panelists for affording us the time to speak with them. Today, we are going to be talking about our current situation and the business prospects beyond COVID-19 and new opportunities for Zimbabwean businesses. I have the honor to be joined by three entrepreneurs who have proved their business acumen time and time again in a tough Zimbabwean environment. Uh, allow me to introduce first Dr. Matsika, who is the founder and MD of Amplified, a creative agency here in Zimbabwe, and also notably the founder of MakeFest. Interestingly, the doctor also has a master's in marketing strategy, as well as a doctorate in marketing research. That's an ex Extensive CV, Doctor. Welcome to the session. Thank you so much, Tendai. I'm, I'm honored really to be here. Thank you so much. Pleasure. We also have with us Mr. Alex Masere, who was a quite sterling record in the corporate sector, rising from an account executive to managing director, one of Zimbabwe's largest brands and then going out on his own to start his own car rental business, the best car rental, which had an incredible 2020 in and amongst the COVID pandemic. They were up there with the best of them doing excellent work. Welcome, Mr. Maseri. Thank you very much, Tendai, and welcome to all the viewers. All right. And last but definitely not least, our very own CEO here at m and J. Um, he is called the Chartered Vendor um, because he began life, in fact, as a vendor, selling airtime and cigarettes in the high-density suburbs of Harare, went on to become an accountant, and then uh, founded m and Consultants. He is now the CEO of m and J which has the consultancy group, a media department, and the tech department all under it. Welcome, Mr. Manyazungu. Thank you, Tendai. Thank you, the audience. All right. So just to get to know you guys a little bit, um, let's start with you, Mr. Nyazungu. A very interesting background coming from being a vendor to CEO of a group of companies. Tell us more about that background. Okay, thank you, Tendai. Uh, I'm Jerry, and I'm a chartered vendor. Uh, it means that I can, I can I have that ability to just sell everything. I think I'm an accountant by profession, but I'm actually now uh, biased towards sales and marketing, and I would like to eat and drink sales every day. So uh, from your question, yeah, yeah, being a vendor, in Zimbabwe, you know, the economy of Zimbabwe wasn't tough for, it was tough for about 20 years now. And uh, in 2005, I had nothing to do, but I had no choice but to be just a vendor in trying to survive, trying to send myself to school. Uh, then I also worked in various companies until I actually found the m like you said. And I also hope to uh, my vision is actually to actually employ maybe 500 people directly and indirectly 5,000 and also maybe having one of uh, my clients as a to register to and actually any of the stock is changing the world. Thank you, Tendai. Absolute pleasure. Those are big ambitions. Uh, we're looking forward to watching you achieve them. Mr. Masere. Um, after conquering the corporate environment, climbing to managing director of one of Zimbabwe's prominent brands, you decided to switch over to entrepreneurship and start your own organization. I'm interested in finding out more about that, the drive and decision making process behind that switch, that transition from being an employee to being an employer. Uh, once again, thank you, Tendai. Uh, for me, it's basically been a case of following your dream. Um, 
you start where you are. That's what I've realized in, in the corporate world. You start where you are, either you are getting employed or you're getting employment from there, then you move on to a position where you can follow your dream. And this is what, we are, what I'm doing right now. I've always had this dream from, I think, uh, uh, kindergarten age up to now, I've always been a love of cars. So this has been like um, a very good dream to, to follow, to see the big cars out there, to have the big cars and to drive whichever car that you want. And also to then take the dream and share it with your clients. So for me, it's, it's, it's really a fulfilling uh, experience that I'm, experience, uh, that I'm living right now. That's excellent. That's excellent. And Dr. Matsika, um, first awards, um, one of the most prominent award ceremonies in Zimbabwe at the moment, definitely in the business sector, up there with the best of them, if not up there alone. Um, tell us more about how that came about. Well, I think mega first, I think if you have gone through the, the internet, uh, it's pregnant with that, uh, with that statement. It was never intentional that we needed to set up a, a big awards industry in Zimbabwe, but we're quite excited even now that we've not only become the, the biggest, but we've become the most prestigious, most recognized, not only in Zimbabwe, but outside. But it came out of a desire primarily just to, to see others doing it very well. I have never won an award in my entire life. And um, I hope one of these days I will get it. But the most important thing that came out of this thing was we wanted to be cheerleaders of our own. You see, when people clap hands for you, you in short, you know, and we felt like, look, Zimbabweans are the most educated of them all on, in, in, in Africa. Why is it that we are missing on certain things? We wanted to become the cheerleaders of industry. So when we started doing it, it was a Bluayo thing. Then it became a national thing. We are slowly and shortly going to become very soon a regional player. So we are quite excited about it. But it came out of a mistake. Mistake was we wanted to focus on Bulawayo. And then Zimbabwe said, Bluayo is too small. Let's go big. Let's go national. So yeah. But we are proud that our roots are in Bulawayo. Awesome. <laughs> that is a glorious mistake, Dr. Mati. How long may it continue? <laughs> OK. So before we delve into the essence of what we're here, what parts of the matter, just a few housekeeping issues from our participants. Uh, just to notify you, that we are also available on the Facebook page. If you're on there at the moment, welcome. Uh, please share, uh, leave a like, leave a comment. We'll go through the comments as well. If you've got any questions, you can leave them there. Uh, the webinar will also be available on demand on our m &J Business TV YouTube channel. So if any of you want to catch this, go through it again dig through the pearls of wisdom, you can find it on our YouTube channel, m and &J Business TV. Okay, so those of you joining us now, welcome. You are just in time for the crux of the matter. So to dive right in, gentlemen, um, we want to talk about the Zimbabwean situation in and amongst the global pandemic and how businesses are reacting to the current environment. I'll start with you, Dr. Matsika. How do you feel that Zimbabwe has fared since the initial lockdown, which I feel was the watershed moment in terms of the economic impact of the pandemic in our country? Thanks, Ndai. I, I'll be very honest with you that the, the pandemic, the COVID-19 took everybody by surprise. Uh, the first lockdown last year, 20, uh, 2020, nobody really anticipated how bad this thing was going to be. In fact, we had never really prepared for it. No company had budgeted for it. And uh, from an African perspective, we thought this pandemic was more prone to the colder areas uh, of the globe. And we were in a self-inflicted uh, comfort zone 
where we felt like, look, Africa is much warmer. Uh, corona cannot really survive in hot weather and so forth. So we, we falsely folded our hands, hoping the, the superpowers would solve their own woes. Unknown to us that this thing was actually crippling right into our backyard. And uh, it has affected organizations, be it financially, uh, the way things are done. Uh, corporately, many organizations were found wanting. Uh, look, it, it took a slightly a detour. Things appeared as if they were going to become better by end of last year. And uh, many of us, we went back again into the, into the comfort zone and felt like this thing is now gone. And voila, 2021 comes up and it's a total shock again. Uh, and uh, trust me, two things are going to happen. The, the strategically positioned organizations will rise up again and reinvent themselves and find a new way of survival. Unfortunately, from a Zimbabwean perspective, 20 to 30% of the industrial guys might not survive. We were laggards, we were laid back and embraced the new normal. It's like embracing a, a, a Goliath. It's almost near impossible. So yes, from a government perspective, from an industrial perspective, from individual perspective, we were all caught unaware. Are we prepared as well to mushroom away from all this thing? The biggest question is, majority of us are not. And if we are not ready to impress the new normal of doing business, unfortunately, many brands, many individuals, many organizations are going to become extinct. And that is the jeopardy that we find ourselves in. The economy is spiraling out of control. Why? Because it's a pandemic that we have never thought and envisaged, and we are clueless right now. But as the dust is beginning to settle that this thing might not be going away anytime, that is the whole purpose of this webinar now. To simply say, what is the way forward? This demon is not going away. We cannot exercise it and it can go. But how best can we learn to live within this new context? Uh, so to answer your question, it's, it's not looking good from a business perspective, not at all. Uh, 80 to 90 percent of the businesses, their bottom line has been affected, and uh, the new strategy that they have, unless and until they embrace the new normal again, we might find ourselves in a more dire situation than we have envisaged ourselves to be in. Well, those are stark words, Doc. Um, a, a real warning shot for the business industry in Zimbabwe. Now, Mr. Maseri, over to you. What is it like? You've heard the environment described by Dr. Masika. What is it like actually running a business in this environment? Thank you, Tendai and Dr. Matsika. I think you, Dr. did uh, justice to, to the earlier question. Um, maybe what I may want to add on is the fact that we are operating in a fragile economy. I think we spoke about this a minute ago that for the past 20 years, the economy has been on its knees. And us as business people, we've been struggling to find ways from a financial, even um, a, a, a financing point of view, because liquidity has always been a challenge in Zimbabwe, because we have been struggling with demand, because demand has always been reduced because of the disposable income of the people in Zimbabwe. So when you look at the facts that are before us in terms of um, the challenges that business are facing is um, you are facing uncertainty. You don't know what's going to happen. As business, one thing that gives you confidence is knowing that tomorrow you are going to operate in a normal environment. And this has been a case for us for the past 20 years or so. And now it's magnified. You don't know. We planned last year, towards the end of the year, you did your strategies, you, we planned for us in, during our strategy meetings. But come January, things have changed. There's been a lockdown. It's total shutdown of business. Now for us business people, that's a huge challenge. So to start with, that's one challenge that you face. The second challenge that you're facing, you're looking at um, demand, like I said earlier. You, as business, we are, we are driven by demand. 
we are driven by our clients, what they want. But our clients, what they want, faced with um, diminishing disposable income, that affects the business world. And also, you have to then look at um, production, the supply side shock. There have been immense shock in terms of the supply side. The people that we have been dealing with, some of them cannot open offices right now. And you are forced to go to a more expensive person, a more expensive um, a supplier. So as business, that also has been affecting us. And you're looking at your numbers, the headcount that you're keeping at the workforce is everyone you have there uh, necessary. Are we reducing the numbers? So all those, these are the challenges that we are facing from a business perspective. But that said, at the end of the day, you're looking to um, continue operating. And to do that, we have to be creative. We have to find ways to live with the new normal, like uh, the good doctor said. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Mr. Masera. I find it very interesting that you uh, highlight the point that we have been living in a very uncertain economy. And if you thought it couldn't get any worse, boy, were we in for a surprise. <laughs> well, over to you, Mr. <laughs> Nyazungu. Um, Operating in the environment that's been described by the last two panelists, has there have has there to be a shift in mindset in how you approach running your organization? Or is it purely an operational shift? Thank you very much, Tendai. Thank you, Dr. Matsika. Thank you, Mr. Masere. I think uh, this guy is actually did justice to the questions. Uh, the environment is actually very tough. I agree with uh, both of them. Uh, it's not an easy time to survive. Uh, most of the people are getting unemployed. Most of the business actually shutting down. Uh, bigger brands in South Africa like uh, your Greyhound and Cityline actually announced yesterday that they are shutting down uh, on the 14th of February. That's the last day they are operating. So if bigger brands in a better economy like South Africa, they are closing, what more of Zimbabwe, which was already in a bad situation for the last 20, 21 years? So that is not easy. But now coming to your question on the mindset, I believe like what the good doctor said, people were caught unaway, uh, were caught pens down. No one was uh, actually prepared for this situation. We're actually mocking the Chinese. We mocked the Europeans. We thought that they're the ones who are eating dogs. Uh, that's why they are getting the disease. They are being punished. But uh, now we have the disease with us. So what I believe, the mind, our mindset now is to completely shift. Like at our organization, if we're working for, from eight to five, sometimes you're supposed to double the hours. You're supposed to put extra work. It's no longer the time of employing employees is the time of actually employing employers. You need to, the whole organization is supposed to have an employer mentality, not an eight to five mentality. Like what Mr. Masere said, the supply side has been affected, the market has been affected, uh, and we're coming into an economy where the credit line, there's actually a shortage of actually the credit lines to support, especially the small to medium enterprises. So if we are the organ, I believe that if the, we address the internal factors, we can come out as part of the 70% of the surviving organization, which are being mentioned by Dr. Matsika. Let us not forget, uh, WhatsApp was actually founded in 2008 during recession. We've got companies like Uber, which was actually founded the same year. We've got Fanta. Mm -hmm which came into life in 1940s, because there was a shortage of, of Coca-Cola in, in, in Germany. So I, I believe that if we change our mindset, if we've got a warp, we can, and there are also opportunities actually, actually coming up with this disease. Not all industries are affected. Some of the industries are actually booming. I think there's actually a new hospital, which is currently charging 2,500 a day just to have a bed of a COVID patient. And mm -hmm. I saw that hospital being built mm -hmm. 
Mm. And it was the time when Dr. what Dr. Masik actually mentioned, things were like things were where we, we thought that things were now going back to normal. I think it was around June, July. But this guy continued push, he pushed until his hospital was actually done, as if he knew that we will be in this situation currently. And he's actually mm. making a killing. His hospital is full. Even the admin staff, as we are speaking, they are working seven days a week. They are making shifts. So I believe that if we change the mindset, we're supposed to be visionaries. There's actually light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you, Tendai. Thank you. A very interesting post there, Mr. Nyansonko. I'm going to come back to you, Mr. Masere. Um, you talked a bit about uncertainty, about a lack of demand, and also about uh, the difficulty in dealing with the channel partners that you're used to in your industry. What do you think is the biggest challenge that businesses in general have faced in the past year? Um, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, um, uh, I think uh, like um, we maybe pointed a little bit on earlier, the biggest challenge really is uh, to do with uh, your clients, right? To do with demand, right? But you see, um, when you are dealing with demand, there are two ways to do it. The first way is you need to then create demand yourself. It's not every day that people know that they want a certain product, especially in our industry. When you go to a normal person in the street and you ask them to hire a vehicle, for them, this is beyond them. They, they will tell you there's no need for that. But you can create this demand through communicating with your, with your clients, through putting up messages out there, through a lot of tactics that you can just list and say, I'm going to do one, two, three, four things, and then create that demand. Because essentially, this is why we survive as uh, organizations, to solve customer problems, to solve which is the demand side of the, of, of the equation. So um, I would say the biggest problem has been demand, which has been affected by the, the, the reduction in, in capacity, the reduction in production, the, 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 uh, your clients are not even accessible to you. You are looking at, uh, we always get people coming from UK, but this December, we didn't have any. So you find that sort of demand has already died down. And, and as an organization, you look and then you say, how best do we then create demand for this? And this is, these are some of the, I'm sure some of these issues we'll discuss as we go. But in terms of creating this demand, now you have to be creative. You have to then sit down with your team and strategize on ways to then find um, an outlet or to find a way of getting to the clients and them coming to you. And when you do that, you can then sustain the organization. But the biggest and major um, challenge is demand. Uh, the, the, is it, are we able to derive? Are we able to push it? Are we able to, to, to get to a point where there is enough demand to, demand to sustain our organization? Ye, Mr. Nyazungu spoke of, uh, of the, um, the gentleman in, in, in the healthcare, you see, he, he was able to foresee and say there is enough demand coming from that side. And then he was able to then follow. And this is what we want as enterprise news to be looking at and to say, we want to solve this issue of demand or of uh, the reduction in demand and the fall of, of, of the clients that we are facing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Masere. And Dr. Matsika, you talked previously about how we were caught unprepared by the current environment, by the current situation. I'm interested to know what should we have done differently? Tendai, there is a problem in Zimbabwe and the problem is escalated to Africa and the rest of the world. We have got people that are learned, people that are knowledgeable, but people without wisdom. The problem we have is we live for today and we don't think about tomorrow. 2020 
the pandemic hit Zimbabwe, everybody jumps into the survival mode. And nobody really thought, how can I outgrow myself and survive into 2021? The problem we have is we lack the professionalism of accepting the situation that are there today, and then we amplify them for tomorrow. There is a problem of COVID today, but COVID, we are almost terming it. What if there's going to be a worse of pandemic than COVID? Have we prepared our mindset for such catastrophes for tomorrow or we live for today? So there is a problem that we have. We have got people with the titles, we have got people with positions, but we are all bench warming. Nobody is doing a clarion call and simply say, gentlemen, we are now in a war-like environment. It's no longer business as usual. I like what the two gentlemen were talking about. They were looking in terms of identifying opportunities. The opportunities that we now need to look at is not what my business can do, but what is the business of others that I can then ride on. We have got companies that are manufacturing P, the, the PPE, the, the clothing, the medicines and everything else. They have got dogmatic mindset because they are thinking within the confines of their own industry. As the big benchers that are now simply saying our industry has been cut short, we are waiting for things to become normal, which I doubt are going to become normal. We are now like people in a stadium. You know, when you're in a stadium and you're sitting at the terraces, you see people playing soccer and everything else. You can almost tell that if only he had struck it this way, if only he had done it this way. So we are being presented with an opportunity outside our industries in terms of simply saying there is an opportunity within the crisis. How best can we outmaneuver it? So like I said initially, other organizations are going to close, but ultimately new organizations are going to emerge of people that had no interest whatsoever in what they're going to be doing now, but opportunities come knocking at their door. So we need to be able to start planning, not for 2021 now, but let's plan for 2022, 2023, 2024. Remember when we were in school, we were being taught the five-year strategic plan. We thought it was just for paper. Now it's reality. Let us now go into 2025. Is it going to be a good day, 2025? And we start moving back to 2021 and try to address problems of the future today. That's how I see us embracing the, in totality, this new era, or which we are now dubbing the new normal. But we were supposed to have been full focused to realize that if it's hitting China, one way or the other is going to hit yeah. Zimbabwe. And if people in China are crying, Zimbabwe is going to double cry. How best can we alleviate a problem before it becomes too much? That's where our mindset, Tendai, we now need to be able to make noise and simply say, this thing, we're really going to cry, but how best can we make it a soft cry than a loud cry? Either way, we're still going to cry. So to me, we need to think along those lines and say, look, let's move away from the comfort zone. Let's move away, really. We are too relaxed to be in a war environment. This is war. Thank you, Doc. Very interesting thoughts. I found it especially interesting how you talked about dogmatic mindsets and how that lines up with what Mr. Masere was saying about um, the need for creativity. And I think it's worth noting that crisis, if you allow it, can unlock your creativity. And I think that's something that we can all benefit from taking note of. Mm -hmm. So if you allow me, I'd like to move on to the financial implications of the pandemic. Mr. Nyazungu, I would like to hear from you on this one. Um, clearly, the money is not flowing as freely now as it was previously. I mean, it was tough before, but it's 10 times tougher now. Um, what type of approach does an organization or a business take with its finances? Are we spending as normal? Are we spending more? Are we spending less? What's the correct approach to take in a situation like this? Uh, thank you very much, Tindai, for that question. Yeah, what I believe in is like what uh, Dr. Matsika Lightfree said, the mindset. 
is the one which is actually killing the, the, our business community and, and the people in general. Uh, like what he was saying, at school we're actually given all the answers. Then we were later examined after the end of each and every time or every year. But in life now, you are given an examination first and you have to solve the problems like just the examination which we have currently, whereby we have an examination of COVID-19 and people are busy looking for solutions. There are a lot of vaccines which have been manufactured by the first world uh, and the third world is not even believing in that. We are saying all sorts of theories which are coming out. But my answer is, if you are in a financial, the financial situation now, we are actually supposed not to retreat. We are supposed to actually attack. If you retreat, you are going to actually add your problems. I like what uh, the two gentlemen were saying. We should now look for other opportunities, not in our line of businesses, but we should look for other viable industries. Like they're actually, some of the products are now on the high demand. Look at your Zumbani. We knew that Zumbani in 2021 will be sold in Bon Marche. Mm. In pick and pay. But do you know that Zumbani was being sold, was being exported to Europe? I once bought one of that packet for 10 USD, a small packet of about 500 grams. But there's someone who had already had a vision to know that this product is going to sell. So I'm saying, uh, if, it's, if a vendor, I, I've got a passion with the, and I've got a soft feeling with the vendors, the vendors, if you're still selling oranges and bananas, what are you doing without Zumbani? If you're still selling your normal apples, what are you still doing? Please take those lemons and eat them on your, on your musica. So this is the mindset which we need. We need actually, I don't believe in reducing the cost. I believe in increasing the first line of the, the profit and loss, which is revenue. So this is the time to, for each and every business to not to look at firing the junior employees. Because most of the organization, what they will do, they will just retrench the junior employees. Then the management will still remain in the company and there will be still high costs. So I believe that those junior employees now, they must be now hunters. We now need a dog which can hunt. Everyone in the organization must be con converted into sales and marketing. Everyone on, on their WhatsApp groups, on their Facebook pages, they must now amplify to actually say, no, we are now marketing the organization. Let us push uh, the brand. We now have to push if this, that's the best car rental. Everyone should know about the best car rental right now. And it's an ideal opportunity whereby everyone is actually at home. Everyone is seated at home and they've got an, they've got an, an, online, uh, an online audience, which is huge during this time. So I believe that instead of uh, the organization retreating, they should actually advance, they should attack use the remaining dollars not to keep them because if you keep them like dr matsika said no one knows maybe this lockdown is going to last until 2023 this is the new normal so we should spend that money to market and advertise your business thank you all right thank you uh, I'll, I'll, oh, allow me to add on that um what i've realized like uh, Mr. Dr. Matsika said earlier, and maybe Jerry alluded to earlier, what I've realized is that most um, entrepreneurs, what we do is you, you go out, you work, you get your first 10,000, you get your first 100,000. And what do you do with that money? You take that money and you want to save it. You see, that kind of mindset in this environment, you may think it's the way out, but actually it's not. When you get your money, you reinvest in the business because this is where you got that $10,000. So to get another 10,000, you need that money working for you in the business. If we take the money that we are getting from the business and we put it 
Um, uh, and we, 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 we put it in a little piggy bag and we say, uh, at the end of the year, we'll get our money. Let me tell you, that money will not in any way increase because you're putting it there. But the best way for you, for us businesses, in terms of financial, the implications that we have faced, also in terms of financial, how we can grow is to whatever little that we are getting in COVID, you have to attack and go 100%. This is where I'm getting five cents. I have $10. Let me put my $10 into that five cents. I'm going to wait before putting money aside and say, this is where you, you, you keep that cash flow running and this is where you get the money when you need it. So as entrepreneurs, and maybe my message is, yes, financial implications are coming, but if you have a business that's giving you 10 cents, put, $10 into it and get 20 cents. Put $20 in it and get 50 cents. And out of the 50 cents, you are now creating your business. Before you know it, you are getting 10 cents today. Later on, you'll be getting $10 from that business. So in terms of financial, I also think let's find ways of putting back money into the organization. And when this happens, this is how an economy functions. Because if I don't use my money and I keep it under the pillow, if I don't invest my money and I keep it under the pillow, we are not driving the economy. We are not driving the demand because it's, it's, it's consumption that keeps, look at the US economy. They don't have anything special, but the only thing they have is their consumers. And how are they consumers through organizations and businesses? And this is what we need to do also to keep our economy running. So in addition to what you were saying, Mr. Nyasungu, yes, let's attack, let's put more, let's call for more soldiers and say, come guys, let's go after this and get more because this is where our loot is coming from. This is where our exploits are coming from. So let's do that. That's uh, what I would want to add on. Thank you very much, Mr. Masere, an excellent addition. And in a way you've anticipated my next question. So I'll stay with you here. Um, you've indicated that yes, we are not retreating, we are on the offensive, we are going to spend more in anticipation of the returns that will come. More specifically, within an organization, where should you pump or where should you funnel your money? Should it be in marketing? Should it be in operations? Should it be in personnel? Where specifically should the money go? Um, you know, there is uh, a point that uh, uh, Mr. Nyasungu uh, mentioned, uh, he said, uh, he spoke about marketing and skills. Um, for me, I think that the most critical skill that a business can he have, if you develop your business around your marketing, demand, like I said earlier, you'll be able to then create it and you can then channel everything else. The first line, that's the sales line that you have, or P, P and L the sales line is one that you need to really drive. You can try is because the thing with the cost, if you want to limit cost today, it means um, you reduce the money that you're marketing and your sales will continue to fall. And at the end of the day, you don't have a, 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 um, you don't have, um, a thriving business and you eventually close. But if you focus on marketing, if you focus on demand creation, and say, I'm going to go out to people and make them buy my thing, my, my products. If you do that, then you are guaranteed of a better uh, future, better tomorrow. So if I have $10, I would put most of my money into marketing. I would put most of my money into sales because once you have sales, you can then feed off your other, um, through your other skills into that and voila, you have a working business. So basically, also, we have to understand that we survive to solve problems, right? So if you have a company that is not known, if you have a company that is that have the best product in the world and it's not known, then the chances of you doing well are very slim. I think some of the products that you find in Zimbabwe, like Mr. Nyazungu was saying, the Zumbam, we have it. Someone is selling it for $10. We are selling it for a dollar. Why? Because we, we don't market ourselves well. We produce good raw materials here. We don't market those, those very well. 
and we end up selling our agriculture products for 50 cents. When they go to better markets, you find people are, say, are, are selling them for much more money. So I would uh, really, really emphasize on marketing and, and, and uh, sales skills development. Those are two key issues that I would put my last dollar. And I know if I do that, two dollars will come from that, from that, uh, from from putting my money there. So that's that's my 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 how I would spend my the last of my money. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Masere. You reminded me of a saying I came across recently. Um, it said, "Stopping marketing to save money is like stopping your watch to save time. It just doesn't work. It just doesn't work." <laughs> <laughs> now, before I come across, to you, it's all right, you know. Yeah, before I come across to you, Dr. Matsika, I would just like to take uh, the opportunity to acknowledge our audience. I see there are a lot of questions coming in already, and we will reserve time towards the end of the session where we will try and go through as many of these questions. So, if you've got any, feel free to put them in the live chat. If you are watching us from Facebook then you can comment and we'll address those questions as well. Remember to like and share so that your friends and as many other people can benefit from this discussion as possible. So coming back to you, Dr. Matsika, we're talking about the money and where it should go and how it should be spent. But I think the question a lot of our audience will want to know is where does it come from to begin with, especially for those that are just starting out in this very hard environment, where, where, where can they get money to fund operations in an environment like this? You see, tonight money is like a magnet. You, a, a magnet can either attract or it can repel. And any serious business that wants to survive within COVID and post COVID, they have to understand that the magnet of money is in people. You massage the ego of people and money will flow directly faster to you. I like the, I'll not mention names, but there's a brand uh, that is well known in the beverage industry that yesterday or this past week, they donated 50,000 US dollars towards uh, Lawai or water issues and everything else. And, and I'm asking myself, 50,000, wow. I want you to understand one thing, that in a war environment, we know who supported us when we needed them the most. The customer does not forget how you became quiet during COVID and you are rising up again after COVID to simply say, no, we are a good company and everything else. The two gentlemen made a very impressive uh, assertion that they need to put their money in marketing. Let's run down and simply say marketing is too broad. They need to put their money in branding. When you brand, my definition of marketing today is very simple. It's making a lot of noise for attention. In this war-torn environment of COVID, make so much noise that people need to understand that there is Amplify, that there is M&J, that there is uh, the best brand as far as uh, Kahaya is concerned. You need to sit in the customer's mind continuously. So money comes from people. Right now is not a time for making profit. It's a time of making sure that the people that are going to make you profitable tomorrow are they safe. You know, many of us gave branded masks to, to clients. It was not necessarily because we wanted them to, 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 to be safe. Yes, we want them to be safe. But we also wanted to make sure that our brand is visible. And the only way to make them visible is to make a win-win situation. You wear my branded mask and my brand is going there. So it's people first before profit. That is the type of marketing that we're talking about, where you are taking the heart of the matter and putting it closer to your chest and simply say, these people, I need them tomorrow. Today, they might not really have the, 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 the income, but tomorrow they will remember. So when you brand yourself in a crisis-like environment, you are embedding your mindset, your product, your, 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 your services in the mindset of a customer. Customers have got long memories. 
Remember those days when we used to queue for sugar at XYZ companies and supermarkets? And then at times the sugar would come out through the, the corridors or uh, the, the back offices and everything else. When things become normal, your mind will still know that I will not patronize this shop. Why? When I needed them the most, they shortchanged me. Now, during this COVID pandemic, it is the time where we are supposed to be more compassionate with our customers because our customers, they are like a bank. We are banking the money, we will retract it or we take it away from them later on in future. Right now, it's a matter of survival. So to me, that becomes very, very important. And again, when you talk in terms of branding, it's more than just the regalia, it's more than just the, 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 the amenities that we give. It's about you being Munu, Ubuntu, and eh, remaining relevant to them. They cannot come to your own where they are. That's when we now talk, I hope you're going to bring it up later on when we now saying, this technology allows me to be in your home tender, to have breakfast with you, to understand your issues and everything else. That's how branding becomes. People can only follow loyal trust with the people like brand. That's where the money is. Money is in people, not in our statements, not in our colors and everything else. How we have packaged our service to become relevant to the people. Okay, I believe we're having a bit of connectivity issues there with the doctor. Hopefully he'll be back with us soon. In the meantime, Mr. Nyazungu, I'm going to come back to you. Um, I want to talk about the people directing all this activity, whether it's the money, whether it's the response to lockdown. The entrepreneur is the one that is behind the business or at the head of a business. Now, not everyone is an entrepreneur. I think we all know this. But one common thread throughout our three panelists today is you are founders. You are entrepreneurs. What is it that makes a good entrepreneur? And at what point did you realize, you know what? I'm an entrepreneur. Thank you very much, Tendai, uh, for that question. Uh, I'll start by actually answering your question, maybe address part of the question which you asked Dr. Matsika. Yes, if you want to be an entrepreneur, if you don't like sales and marketing, just to quit uh, the dream of being an entrepreneur, goodbye. Because there's no way you're going to be an entrepreneur without knowing how to sell or how to market. And I also agree with uh, what the... South African business school actually says, his name is Vusi Tembe Kwai. He says, if you, are, if, you, if, if you don't know sales, if you don't know marketing, just don't be an entrepreneur. And most people, they think that they're entrepreneurs whilst they're actually self-employed. An entrepreneur is someone who can leave his business for three months running whilst he's at a holiday without even communicating with the business. It means that is a going concern. Because a, a private limited or a, a, a public company, it's a company which is got a, a going concern. But most of these business don't have the going concern. Like what the good doctor was saying and like what Mr. Macero was saying, most people, uh, we are just surviving on, on, on hand to mouth. We are not thinking big. Uh, the biggest enemy of, of our business people is that we think small. We don't think big. We just think of... Uh, if we get our salaries, if we are able to pay our salaries, if we are able to pay our rentals, uh, if someone is, is in found of an organization, is an owner of the organization, if he purchases a car, a, a, a Benz, or, or a, a Prado, a house in Borodeo, they are done. They don't think big. We want people who think big, like the likes of Elon Musk, who wants to create life in, in Mars. We need people who wants to own private jets. We need people who are ready to own the whole Ferrari. If you think big, you don't limit yourself. But the problem is now we kind of limit ourselves because we only think of what is what will happen the next week or what will happen the next month. That's why when, it, when, when there's a crisis now, just think about it even in your family. If you've got someone who's going to be diagnosed with cancer, 
are you able to pump out all that money? So if you're an entrepreneur, I believe that you're someone who's, suppo who's not supposed to be limited by, by budgets or targets. Your goals must be like, even right now as we are in a crisis, I urge all the entrepreneurs not to flex their budgets. They mustn't reduce their targets. They must, it's now 10 times harder to reach to those targets, but please don't reduce them in order for you to say, I want to reduce it because my, my staff members need to feel comfortable. You are not supposed to stay in your comfort. In other words, I'm saying you are supposed to stay broke if you're an entrepreneur. If you see yourself yeah. comfortable that you have got a, a 10,000, a $1,000 in your pocket, a savings of 100,000 or a million, you are not yet an entrepreneur. You must be always hungry. Then on, on partially on what uh, you asked Dr. Matsika, I like the way he spoke about money. I also, that money is just like water. Money is easily available. Money is not scarce. What is actually scarce is time. Money is just like water in, the, in an ocean. I, as Jerry with my m and we we're just taking a glass of water. That's Mr. Masere is taking a Jojo tank. But mm. wow, we've got Elon Musk is coming up with a river to take the whole water. So it's all about creating that. If, if customers are just attracted to what you are selling, you can sell something which is liked by everyone. Like I've got examples of people who are venturing in those, uh, like we're doing even sanitizers and a lot of cleaning material. What is lacking in those business? It's not because their products are bad. It's because they are not known. So I always say, in order to get money, you must be also ready to, pull, to, to actually give money. We talk about give, 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 give. Let us give money to the market. Let us give value to our clients. Let us build those business systems. Because when you go to a big supermarket, you are just following a business system. Mm. When someone is eating chicken and chips from that big brand, it's not because our wives and our girlfriends cannot cook better chicken or better chips, but we are just following a system. Try to give your daughter, when your daughter cries, uh, crying for a certain chicken brand, if you give her, chicken and chips which is actually better than that brand they won't be satisfied they are just mm. following a system so if a kid can follow a system imagine a grown-up man they always follow a business system so i say to entrepreneurs invest in business systems if you mm -hmm. see yourself doing the accounts doing the marketing yeah, even I have seen these entrepreneurs when they if they are faced with a legal issue, they go and register for law at University of Zimbabwe. If they feel that they now want to market like we are preaching here, they are going to join a digital marketing school. If they are going to see that uh, maybe accounts is lagging, they want to do a degree on accounts. You cannot know everything. Recruit smart people and to pay them enough. Don't be a, like you operate. If even if you see with musicians, people are ready to attend and to invest into a into a musician who's playing with a band. But you cannot play this this wonderful song alone, especially in these trying times. Well, sometimes actually good suggestions are coming from the janitors. They're coming from the guy who is actually cleaning your toilets. They are the ones who make your organization survive during this time. I thank you, Tendai. All right. Thank you, Mr. Nyazungu. The title of the show encompassed opportunities. And I'm sure that's what a lot of the audience members really want to hear about. Where are the opportunities? What are the real opportunities? So, Mr. Masera, I'm going to come to you. And I want to know just generally before we hone in on the COVID situation, 
what does a good opportunity look like? How can an entrepreneur or a business person tell that this is a good opportunity as opposed to a bad opportunity? All right, thank you, Tendai. Um, I'll put it in short, simple. If there is a problem and you have a solution, right? If producing the solution um, is cheaper than what people are willing to pay for the problem, then you have a good business. Because it's all about solving problems. I will tell you right now, you drive around going to, to Kwazana, you see cars parked, people, there are a lot of um, people, they've got, uh, they're, they're using the car boots for, 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 for trading and they are making, these are opportunities that are just everywhere. The unfortunate thing that we've been taught at school is that you want, we want to complicate matters. Uh, I think earlier we spoke about Sumban. It's everywhere. It's there. There are seasons when we know Kunema Shuku and people drive out there and they bring them in town and they start selling them. It's just identifying what people want. And when you know, you look at the, the evaluating it is, are people willing to, 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 to pay more than the pro, pro production cost? If they are, then it's a, it's a viable business. The more we call you, what, what you then learn is that in business, as long as you start, you take the first step. When you take the first step, you don't have answers to everything that you are going to encounter in business. But when you take the first step, what happens is you start to learn things as you go. You start to get answers as you go. You start to get more opportunities. You see that Ah, for example, MNJ started this, um, maybe, um, I think they were registering companies. But right now, when you go to MNJ, is that the key business they're doing? No. So for an entrepreneur, the first thing is find something that you can do, like a, 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 a problem that you can solve. It doesn't have to be big. You come here, you see, oh, these people, or oh, I go to MNJ, I see oh, they are not branded. They need uh, shirts that, that say it's branded like uh, my good doctor's best uh, amplified. What do I do? I then look for the shirts and tell, tell them, look, I can do this for you for so much. That's an entrepreneur, that's a business. And then you have started a business. You see, it's working. Yesterday I was with a, with a gentleman who has got a chain of five shops. And of course the shops are closed. When you go the first, first side, they are closed. But behind what are they doing? They are supplying some tenders, five, six tenders. And this business didn't start 20 years ago. It started just a few years ago, about three, four years back. Right now, it's well known in all the big um, uh, companies that, that, that procure um, branded uniform for, the, for their staff. So this is uh, a, what I'm saying for business. It's just identifying a problem and then coming up with a simple solution at a uh, a cost cheaper than what people are willing to pay, then you have a business. And when you do have a business, now we, 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 we can then start to push that because I said earlier, it's first step, that's the first step. And then your next step is in business. You are taking the, you're, you're getting to know your clients more and you see bigger opportunities than the initial one. And at the end of three, four years, you are totally doing something different. Why? Because you have, you have just done something. Nike says, just do it. This is what we mm. need to do. If you see an opportunity, mm. just do it. Just do it. Go for it. If you, I, I'll give you an example. If today you start um, um, learning about exercising and you spend five years or even three months learning about exercising and you say, ah, no, I need to, to reduce my, 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 I think my time has outgrown me. Let me find a way of just reducing that pot belly. Three years going on internet and learning about it and doing nothing. Do you think there will be change on you? Zero. Nothing. It might be a mm. very great idea, but if you don't do, if you don't act, that's zero. You are not doing anything. There will be no change. So once you identify, solve that problem, but solve it at a price that is uh, more than what people, uh, that is the more than your production cost. If you do that, you're in business. That's uh, what I is, is the key to identifying this opportunity. Mm, I, I really like that little formula you gave us. Find a problem. If 
the cost of solving it is lower than what people are willing to pay, you found an opportunity. That's excellent, excellent content there, Mr. Maseri. And Dr. Matsika, over to you in terms of opportunities. What is it that you believe stops people from taking advantage of opportunities? Because we've all seen it. Someone sees an opportunity, they identify it, they try to strategize on how they can take advantage of it, but the action never seems to come about. What is it that you believe stops people from taking opportunities? The, 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 the most important thing to, uh, that you need to understand before you even identify opportunities is have you invested in the right social capital? Many people are afraid that they cannot do something because they do not have startup capitals or they do not have the right necessary resources and so forth. And, and I would want to say that is primitive thinking. If you decide to get into business, to become an entrepreneur, you have declared war, you are now a soldier, you are now a warrior, you have a mindset, a tactical mindset that says, I am in battle and I'm in a war environment and my ultimate aim is to win. So you invest in what I call social capital, you have the right people in your circle. I, I've heard of the statement that some of us rise by sitting on the shoulders of giants. When you sit on a shoulder of a giant, when the giant stands up, you stand up with them as well. If you sit in the circle of men and females that have got more resources than you, and you have invested in that relationship, it's easier for you to sell that idea and simply say, I am seeing something that you're not seeing. They may not get what you are saying, but because of the relationship that you have, they will rise, make you rise by simply saying, okay, we will stand for your sake. So to me, fear, number one. Number two, we are not having the right social investments. When you go through your WhatsApp, when you go through your phone, you realize that many of the people that are there are redundant. They are people of no use and value towards your vision of creating change in this side of life. So it is important that let's invest in our social capital. Yes, the bottom line in terms of making money is important, but look at yourself. You have no money. You have no resources whatsoever. But are the people in your circle ready enough to support that vision? You see, the opportunity that knocks at your door and I is not the same opportunity that knocks at my door. But because I am your power, I'm your peer, and I want you to see you succeed. I am tempted and persuaded to push through that vision that you're seeing that is going to inactivate certain opportunities. I may not benefit much. Maybe you're going to give me back my money with a bit of a profit, but what yambuka. So that is the most important thing that you need to understand. Let's invest in our social capital. Africa, Tans, one pass, we love to pull each other down. You see somebody succeeding in a kind environment, you feel like, okay, let me also get into it. Do I have the vision to run a very good car hire environment? No. Somebody is doing tomatoes and they're doing very well. I feel like, look, I think I can sell them better. And you get in there. Instead of investing in good social capital, we are busy fighting each other and pulling each other down. We are giving the media reason for H Metro to make profit by simply going there and selling things, some of them fictitious in their nature. Why? Because you do not want to see others uh, succeed. Unknown to you that when a black man succeeds, he has to have the impetus of bringing others up as well. That is what we call social investment. Check the record. Any person in Zimbabwe that has done very well knows that he needed to have somebody that they'd invested in to believe in them. So to me, Tendai, the reason why we are not really pushing and embracing these opportunities is because we, do not, we are bankrupt socially. We are bankrupt, bankrupt. We have what people that have no value whatsoever. And those that have the value in just we no, 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 no. I think these guys, they went to this Sangoma and they've got these things and everything else. Come on, we are bankrupt socially. So social capital is what we need to invest in. Very interesting talk. And I think that those are words that will force all of us to look at ourselves a bit more. 
uh, as we approach opportunities. Mr. Nyazungu, I want to now focus specifically at opportunities within the COVID and lockdown scenario. In an existing organization, whether it be amplified, the best car rental, or M and J, an already existing established opportunity, where are the big opportunities at the moment? Um, how do you use the current climate to our advantage? Uh, thank you very much, Tendai. I, I think uh, there are actually a lot of opportunities currently. Because if you look at it, uh, they're actually large organizations. Some large, of, large organizations have kind of, uh, they've reduced the way they used to operate. They've uh, subsidized their operations. So it's the time for small players to actually come in and fill those gaps. Like for example, I'll take it for example, like the Grand Greyhound seat liner. Yes, it's not good for the economy. There are many people who are employed by that company in South Africa, but it's a chance for, 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 for other bus operators. Soon after COVID, they will have to fill in, in those shoes, like those big shoes which have been filled by uh, your ground and your city line. So this is an opportunity in the bus industry. Like in the airline industry, we've got the giants like Virgin Airlines, they've quit. It means it's a chance also for small players. If in, in the, even in the food industry, like currently during lockdown, uh, most of the business, are, are they're, they're actually down and they're not operating. It's a chance for the small player to actually come in. But there's no way you are going to fill in those shoes without investing into a business system. Because people specifically buy because of a business system. And I actually liked what Dr. Matsika said, to say it's all about the mindset. It always starts in the mind. Like even what Mr. Mercedes said, that you should identify an opportunity. There is no way you are going to identify an opportunity if you are busy blaming others. I just say to you guys, let us, let us quit blaming our, our, our background. Let us quit blaming the government. Let us quit even blaming the opposition parties. Let us quit blaming other other, even your parents are like Dr. Masek was saying, even Anambuya Nana Kumushauko, Vanswa Nekunze. We are failing because of Gogoningi, which I believe if those people are really powerful, why can't they also be which old big brands like Econet? We should actually change our mindsets. Do you think that uh, our doctors drive Masiwa in their families, they, are, they, they don't have old people? I believe they are there, but he has got to, he changed his mentality. So I believe everyone should actually change the mindset before, because you know, many people are not even applying for jobs. I think Tendai, you know, we don't want to recruit as many people, we don't want to recruit as many people this month, but we are failing because people are not even sending their CVs. They believe that there are no, there are no opportunities, it's locked down. There is even someone who is saying, if you ask for, the, for, for your money, they will tell you this funny reason. It's during lockdown. I will give you money after lockdown. Or I'm broke because of lockdown. Some have even, uh, COVID-19 is now a reason for them not to perform. <laughs> yeah. They now blame COVID-19 for their failures. Your business account was on zero balance before COVID appeared in China. So why do you think it will have a million right now? That's the question you are supposed to ask yourself. So I believe that even if I check, the best car render wasn't started with any capital. I believe that even if the good talk is going to confirm even amplified, wasn't started with any money. MNJ was started with a $40 laptop. But you are busy saying if I find a loan, if I find someone who can give me a loan, I'll start a business. Come on, wake up, smell the coffee. This is the real time to actually make money. Whilst the people are crying, at MNJ we're actually saying we're going to recruit as many people as we can during this lockdown. 
because the job which is now there, the targets which are there, they now need more hands. So let us quit blaming other people. Let us quit if someone is successful, if someone buys his own Ferrari, his own Lamborghini, someone chose to live the way he wants, you start saying Akaba, you start saying Aninyoka, like Doctor was saying, you start saying he's close to the powerful people. That is what is stopping our guys from actually developing. Let us behave like what the Americans do. They are up there, they are the most powerful country in the world because they, they, they can't, there's a, it's a country of sales and marketing people. We haven't even invested in our sales and marketing as a country. That's why it is even hard for us to be actually recognized in the world. Look, small countries, as small as Japan, they are powerful because it is a land of sales people. They know how to sell brand to Japan. So let us get out, guys. We should learn the skill of actually developing our mindset. Check on your phone book. I want you to actually delete some of the people who are in your phone book. Because they won't help you, they'll just pull you down. Thank you, guys.